Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cambridge IGCSE and International AS and A-Level Science webinar today. Thank you for joining us. So my name is Tamsin Hart from Cambridge University Press, and I'm joined today by Dr. Mark Winterbottom and Sally Barbieri. Dr. Mark Winterbottom is a senior lecturer in science education at the Faculty of Education, the University of Cambridge. Mark co-leads the secondary PGCE course, teaching on the science and biology programmes. His research interests are in learning through inquiry and in out of the classroom approaches to science education. Mark is the pedagogy consultant on our new Cambridge International AS and A-Level Science series, more on which later. Sally Barbieri is an experienced education consultant specialising in English as an additional language and is the English as a second language consultant on our science series. You can find out more about our science resources at cambridge.org forward slash education forward slash science and I'll be sharing that in our slides with you later on. So let me now hand over to Dr Mark Winterbottom. Good morning everybody um, or I should say good afternoon or maybe even good evening so wherever you are you're very welcome. So um, my brief is to talk to you about teaching and learning in Cambridge IGCSE um, initially and then a little bit later on in Cambridge A-level and what I thought I'd start with is some big ideas that really should underpin teaching and learning um, across all of your teaching. So let's go. First of all, you need to know what you're teaching. Now that sounds really obvious, but don't imagine you can just read a textbook before the lesson. You've got to really get into those big ideas that sit behind what you're trying to teach and then think about how those ideas build up progressively. So what do you need to know first? What do you need to know second? And what do you need to know third? So for example, if, if we're thinking about teaching osmosis, you'd really want to start with particle theory, then move on to diffusion, the random movement of particles, then think about the different concentrations of solute and water, and then start to get students to predict the direction of diffusion of both solute and water particles, and then start to put the membrane into the model so that you really start from what they know or from what you can teach very straightforwardly and move through layers of complexity until you reach the end. Now, that kind of approach is underpinned by some good um, educational theory, um, and it really refers to knowledge being in little pieces that you stick together. Also though, you've got students who've been spending their lives trying to make sense of the world and developing their own scientific ideas as a result of that. And often their ideas are very different to what we want to teach. So what you wanna do is provide the opportunity for them to realize that their ideas aren't quite as you think they should be. So that means providing them with something that conflicts with their ideas very directly. So for example, asking students to make predictions before a piece of practical work or before using a simulation and then collecting data which then shows them the problems in their understanding and challenges the prior ideas that they'd had. And that again, that approach comes from some really good educational theory and educational research. So two approaches, one of which is to build very progressively their learning and one of which is to try to challenge their learning and using those in combination is probably the best thing. So the second big idea, can I move it on? Turns in, I don't think I can move it again. Very strange, right, I've got to come down a bit, right. Is getting students to work out ideas for themselves. So they don't just learn by receiving your wisdom, um, as I'm sure you know, but get them to think about new ideas and get them to fit that into what they already know and to build links between the concepts that you're trying to um, get them to take on board. So think about what the learning intentions are and think about what you can do to enable students to work out that learning for themselves. And you can almost do this with pretty much everything. Physics is a little bit harder, chemistry is pretty straightforward and biology is very easy. So work out what they've got already, work out what questions you might need to ask or work out what activities you need to give in order for them to come to the learning themselves. So an, a really simple example is about getting students to collect data, to plot and interpret the graph, and therefore work out what the relationship is between two variables. And they've done it all themselves. You'll have had to have told them nothing. Brilliant. So where do we go next? Well, I think it's worth focusing on two general teaching and learning approaches, one of which is particularly relevant to science, but it's important to come at it very, very much in a general way. And that is language. 
And I'm going to talk about talk, I'm going to talk about reading, and I'm going to talk about writing. Talk and language in general are the most important tools we have to get students to learn about science. So try to use open-ended questions to get students to think. When they give you answers, comment on them, but ask other students to comment on them too. Build that dialogue in your classroom, because what it does is it allows those students to start to build ideas as a group and individually, and it exposes what they think to you as well. Do use group work for exactly the same reasons, but make sure students have got clear roles, expectations and responsibilities. Otherwise, sometimes your group work will fail and then you kind of give up on it. But really think about what each student is expected to do. Concept cartoons are big tools for us to encourage classroom dialogue. If you've not seen them, then you can Google them. However, they essentially work like this. You have a character in the middle who is saying something which they think is scientific, but is usually wrong, let's put it bluntly. And then you have other people around the outside who are giving alternative views, and they're all talking about a particular phenomenon. So let's have a think. Imagine a snowman standing in the middle of a, of a set, and one student standing next to that snowman is saying, don't put that, snow, don't put that coat on the snowman, it's going to melt him. And then another student is saying, no, 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 put the coat on the snowman, that will stop him from melting. And maybe another student is saying, oh, I don't really know. Now, how do you use this? Well, put it on your screen or give it to your students and ask who agrees with which character and ask them to justify their reasons. And then generate an argument in a nice way so that one person's reasons are juxtaposed against another person's reasons. And in that way, you can gently steer the conversation to bring the class to the correct scientific view. Other ideas, don't forget giving students thinking time after you ask a question. That's not just important to get them to think, but it communicates the expectation that they will think. Give lots of praise to students for contributing to discussion because you want that to build more and more and more. And have a look around the internet for good ways to generate talk. So talking in pairs, putting pairs into fours, having three people working together with two people discussing and one person listening sending envoys from one group to another to give different ideas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's loads of really good ideas. So let's talk. Now, let's think about reading. Reading is also important because this is where you get students who are really focusing on their own understanding. And if they're reading, they're starting to think and they're starting to really build individual understanding. So there's a series of strategies on the screens. The ones that I particularly like on this screen are predicting how sentences should end by completing the second half of a sentence. And I particularly like labeling part of a text, for example, each force that's mentioned in a particular passage or breaking that text down into segments which do different, different jobs, if you like, in the text. Other really nice ways of taking di a diagram and turning that into text, or taking a text and turning that into a diagram, really makes students unpick what's underneath, um, what the diagram or the text is trying to communicate about the science. Sometimes we don't really realise quite how, di how important diagrams are, because diagrams are supposed to simplify and provide a much more simple model of um, scientific thinking. Occasionally, and perhaps more often than we think, they don't. They make it more complex because they're having to adapt to a slightly different visual medium. So really planning in strategies to engage with those diagrams is important. Writing. I think there's three ways to use writing. One of them is writing to learn. One of them is writing to reason. And one of them is writing to communicate. So in writing to learn, answering questions fits into this category because the question is making you think. And when you think, you're testing new ideas and building new ones. Preparing a summary, putting ideas together, deliberately trying to get a student to make connections in their own mind. And even writing their own questions for an end of unit quiz for the whole class works too because they're reflecting on their understanding. So they're still learning, but you're using writing as a way of making them do it. Writing to reason, brilliant. It fits into what we do in science really well. It gets them to analyse and criticise evidence, more on this later, and to synthesise and to evaluate ideas. And writing to communicate when you really want to know what they're thinking and you're trying to um, assess what they've learnt, then encourage alternative tasks, not just 
very straightforward write-ups, but poems, storyboards, concept maps, cartoons, letters, newspaper articles, etc., gives much more purpose to their writing, as well as building the scientific learning that they've got into what they say. So that's writing. Another big general strategy is about assessment for learning. And remember, I'm sure that you're very au okay with good strategies for assessment, but formative assessment really works when you get evidence about students' achievement, which you elicit, interpret, and use, or which your learners or their peers do the same with to make decisions about the next step in their teaching and learning. Dylan William, um, I think back in 2010, came up with five big strategies which, um, which really help you to work out where a student is, where you want them to get to, and how they're gonna get there. So remember those three, where is the student now, where do they wanna go, and how will they get there? And those five strategies came out of his research, and then lots of people have then worked on them to turn them into classroom approaches. So here's the first one, clarifying, sharing, and understanding learning intentions and success criteria. So this is about where we're going, where we're gonna to get to. Um, so in order to enable learners to progress, the teacher must make the learner aware, aware of where they are going. This means not only sharing learning outcomes and success criteria, but also demonstrating to students what good looks like. So how, does that, how can we make that happen? Well, we could take some good examples of work, perhaps students hand in some work after a week's homework, and then you look at it, you take three good examples, and then you put them around the class so the students can evaluate them and decide why they're good. Then they go away and they refine their homework and hand it in next time. We've done student-generated test items before. We could also have them ranking exemplars of work so that we know how good, so they have to judge how good they are, so they then have to engage in the success criteria. What not to write is nice, as a whole class activity, getting them to suggest what would not be good in a particular response to a task. And even providing just simple writing frames that provide them with questions that allow them to, um, to think in the right way. Second, engineering effective classroom discussions, activities and learning tasks that elicit evidence of learning. There's loads here. So giving wait time, think, pair, share, getting students to score their confidence in something, um, doing hot seat questioning with one child in the middle and the class are asking them questions till they can't answer one right. The questioner then moves into that hot seat. Mini whiteboards, which they hold up to assess for all of their understanding, providing small groups with discussion questions, not allowing hands up, because if, if you take hands up in your class, then you can be very, um, what's the word? You can be sucked into thinking that, um, that everyone's understood because the people who put their hands up tell you they've understood, but all the rest of the people haven't. So cut hands up out of your classes and just pick on people. Identify people to ask questions, answer questions. Providing exit passes, a little summary of what they've learned, and hinge point questions. Hinge point questions are last because they're really important. So hinge point questions are those where you ask that question, you assess learning, maybe through many whiteboards, and the outcome of that assessment determines where you go next in your lesson. Do you plow on or do you stop and do something else that tries to reinforce learning? Those questions need thinking about, you need to be really careful of them, you need to test them, they should have only really particular answers that give you proper assessment information and you can read much more about them on the web. Third, providing feedback that moves learning forward. So um, avoid grades is what the research says and provide just constructive feedback and enable learners to engage with the feedback. So for example, telling a learner there's two errors on in their work and getting them to find the errors and fix them is much more productive to their learning than telling them where the errors are, strangely. Um, take, marking people's work and then matching the comments to a piece, of, your comments to the pieces of work that have been handed in. So photocopy maybe five, photocopy five comments, and they've got to think about how those comments fit to the work. And maybe get them to, so, simply to answer three questions which test their learning. Next, activating learning, learners as instructional resources for one another. Um, this really means cutting your workload because you really want them to ask you last. You want them to ask their peers first and to give feedback to each other and to support each other's learning. And often that's much better, um, simply because they speak the same language, they understand the same challenges as their peers have got, and then they can support each other's learning in response. So what, what do we have here? We've got providing um, a best composite test paper. Everybody writes one question, and then they review all the questions and decide which ones are the best to go into a test. 
um, speed dating revision, where essentially you've got people sitting opposite each other, they've each prepared something which, um, which they're expert on and they explain to their partner and every two minutes or so they rotate round so they're explaining to somebody else. Um, simple peer feedback, maybe two stars and a wish, model two things that are good and one thing that could improve, um, etc. In terms of peer assessment, you may need to help them to say sensible things. So try to structure that peer assessment against the success criteria. Otherwise, they'll simply say, this was nice, it was well presented, the handwriting was neat, etc. You want them to comment on what the science learning was within there. And then finally, activating learners as owners of their own learning. This means getting them to take a bit of autonomy and to think that this is their learning, not just your teaching. Um, so, for example, learning portfolios, extending homework, or doing self-assessment through traffic lights. Science-specific teaching and learning approaches. Practical work clearly is one. All I have to say here for now, I will come back to it later, is just make sure it's going to do what you want it to do. Will the students see what you want them to see and do what you want them to do? And will they learn what you want them to learn, both conceptually and procedurally? And then learning through inquiry, it's slightly different because it doesn't always have to involve practical work really focus on what you're trying to get students to do in that inquiry. If you look at the right hand side of the table here, this is, is very much a structured way of doing inquiry and on the left hand side of the table is very much a more open way to do inquiry. One inquiry doesn't need to have all of the categories on the left, it can have just some of them. For example, you could give data and they could simply analyse it and explain. Or they could plan the whole thing from posing their own question to reflecting on the results. So use this table as a bit of a framework for thinking about how you plan your inquiries, because I think it really helps, and we will come back to it later. In terms of skills, what do your students need? Well, in um, Cambridge IGCSE um, syllabus, it talks about handling information and problem solving. Um, and remember, this I think was 30% of what the assessment is, and just scan down the slide there, there's quite a lot in there that you mustn't forget to plan into your lessons and plan into your students' tasks. So using information to identify patterns, making predictions, solving problems, translating information from one form to another, they have to do this in their examination, so you've got to prepare them. And it's good to prepare them, because you're trying to generate scientists, and scientists do this stuff. And then in terms of experimental skills and investigations, um, planning experiments, investigations, making and recording observations, this is pretty standard fodder for us. Um, but just make sure when you think about that inquiry table a few slides ago, you're really doing it at, at multiple levels, if you like, sometimes telling them very much what to do and sometimes opening it up so they have much more ownership. So they've got that ownership of learning we talked about a little while ago. Don't forget the maths. Maths is so important, both in terms of their assessment, but also in terms of biology jobs and chemistry jobs and physics jobs, perhaps in particular, going forward. You can't avoid the maths now as a professional scientist. So really focus on it. What are the challenges to you? Number one, teaching out of your specialism, I empathize with entirely. Um, many of us feel like biology or chemistry or physics teachers. And that might be partly because of subject knowledge, it might be because the disciplines are taught slightly differently, it might be because we just have an identity as a biologist or a physicist. Um, this is always a challenge. If you're teaching at a specialism, give yourself a lot more time to prepare your subject knowledge and planning for that progression of ideas. Try also to do a bit of wider reading around so that you've got a little bit extra in terms of explanatory stories or, or anecdotes. Practical work, it takes time and it costs money. We, we get that um, and sometimes people don't think it's valuable. If you're going to use it, again, go back to what we said before. Will the students do and see what you want them to see and will they learn what you want them to learn? And again, it's either conceptual ideas or process skills. And then mathematical skills is probably our bigger challenge, um, partly because students often learn maths procedurally, which means they don't understand what they're doing. And therefore, it's very hard to apply those skills and in science, we don't signpost our maths problems very well. In maths, they tell them this is about trigonometry or it's about measurements. But in science, we have to remember to do that. And because they're having to learn a scientific concept at the same time, it can be quite hard. The biggest thing I see in 
in new teachers when they're teaching is that they ask students to draw a graph and the lesson is gone because it takes them a whole 40 minutes to draw a graph. In maths they draw one in 10 minutes but it's because they don't see the links between. So really think about teaching the math skills separately in your science lessons and helping them to see how they're relevant. And finally, language. Um, now, the students with English as an additional language, and I'm going to hand over to Sally in just a second to talk about that, but in science, learning scientific words is the equivalent of learning vocabulary in a foreign language. Some everyday words can have very different meanings in science, like energy, work, and power. Some are used differently in a science context, like random, linear, or abundant, and logical connectives um, often cause problems. Those are words which are things which imply addition, opposition, cause, time, those kinds of things. And finally, science really is multimodal. We've got diagrams, we've got formulae, we've got graphs. It's a challenge and you must really engage with that challenge because otherwise your students will find it difficult to learn. So that's me done on IGCSE and I'm going to hand over to Sally who's sitting just to my right and we're going to do a quick switcheroo and then, um, and then I'll come back a little bit later. Hello everybody, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so my section really is to talk about the realisation that your learners are learning science, but they're learning science through a language which is not their first language. So I just want to uh, talk about a few key considerations uh, when you are uh, in, the, in the classroom and you're doing your teaching and learning. So for me, I started by making a list of some of the key elements. Um, so for me, language is all about confidence. And if your learners feel anxious in your classroom because they're having to uh, talk about and function with science, but in English, which is an additional language for them, if they're feeling anxious, actually the stress can really block learning. So I think we really need to think about that. Um, and to think about how we can actually get over uh, that and to, to ease that anxiety. So really, um, to do that, we need to build what I call a safe learning environment where it's okay to make mistakes and actually we can learn through those mistakes. Uh, so it really is about uh, building good collaboration and actually learners supporting each other. Um, and this actually echoes something that Mark said earlier, the fact that because they are processing science, but in a language which is not their first language, then actually they do need a little bit more time for that. So actually what is happening is your learners are, are absorbing the science content in English. And what will be happening is they will be actually translating that back to their first language thinking about the science content in their first language and how they're going to respond, but then they're going to translate it back into English and then respond. So obviously our brains are amazing and we can actually process that fairly quickly, but obviously it just takes that a little bit more time. So I call it wait time. So just, just pause a little bit and don't jump straight in. Just give them that little bit of, of space to, to process that whether you're giving uh, information or instructions, it's the same. Um, the biggest thing for me, one of the two biggest things is actually the, the technical and the academic vocabulary that learners will need to use in learning science. So of course, um, science is very content based and there are lots of uh, technical vocabulary that they will need to use uh, to process and, and to develop their ideas of science. Um, and it's actually not unique to second language or additional language learners. It's exactly the same for first language learners too. Uh, this is much more abstract vocabulary. It's not in their everyday vocabulary. And so even for first language speakers, uh, this can pose a, a challenge. The other thing to consider is the academic language as well. So if you think about uh, sort of traditional or classical questions that uh, often we ask our learners to answer or to process, um, there are lots of uh, academic words in there and I'm going to show you some examples of that in a bit. And this also echoes what Mark said earlier, that actually words, they might understand what some words mean in standard English. So when they're having conversations, you know, in other subjects or day to day, then actually they might understand these words, 
but it's very likely that they've got a totally different meaning in the context of science. And this is really important to help our learners to understand uh, and to help them not, you know, to, to avoid some of the confusion there. Um, for me, the other big thing, as well as technical vocabulary, is actually the structures that they need to communicate. Um, so if you think about some of the processes in science, sometimes we might be asking our learners to make predictions. So do they actually have the structures in English to be able to make predictions? Um, very often we might be asking them to compare. So for example, compare the properties of different materials. Do they have the language structures to be able to do that? So if we just consider uh, both the vocabulary and the structures that they're going to need for each lesson, um, then we're, we're helping them. And it actually goes straight back to the first point about easing anxiety. So if we give them the, the structures for them to base their science around, it's going to feel a lot more comfortable for them. Also in science, it's not, you know, instructions and processes are not so straightforward, especially when we get into IGCSE and A-level. So very often we have instructions which are multi-step um, and, and fairly complex. So anything that we can do to break those steps down and actually guide our learners through those, then the better. Um, now, if we think about using a, a textbook or a course book, there is an awful lot of content on just one page. So again, I think the key theme here is to break things down and not to be tempted to teach everything on a, a page out of a, a textbook or a course book in one lesson. I feel that you could easily use the content on one page of two or three and possibly more sessions. So again, it's about breaking some of these concepts and processes down. Uh, again, this echoes something Mark has brought up already about visuals. So very often we use diagrams, we use illustrations, and it is supposed to make life easier. It's supposed to illustrate the concepts, some, sometimes complex co uh, context uh, behind uh, some of the processes. But we can't assume that these visuals are instantly recognisable. Um, I'm going to show an example in a moment and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, and, and human nature, what we actually do when we're looking at diagrams. And finally, on this first section, um, very often, because science, you know, especially when we're getting up to these higher levels, is, it does, does actually include a lot of complex processes and therefore the language is complex as well. So we tend to use higher structures and we use things like the passive voice uh, and it might be things that they're just not as used to using and hearing uh, as other simpler structures. So it's just having a, an awareness of these as well. So moving on, in particular with reading. So before I talk about uh, what is on the slide there, reading is, is particularly challenging in English because English is not a phonetic language. So in many languages, the letters that you read on a page is how you pronounce it, which is fantastic. I really wish English was like that too, but it's not. Um, so actually reading an English word, especially some of the really complex uh, technical vocabulary that our learners are going to be accessing, uh, actually they, it, there are not that many clues to how to pronounce. So if we, as their teacher, say the word, when they hear it, they recognize it, but do they recognize it when they're reading? So this is always a good thing just to consider and really to check. So with some of this key vocabulary, uh, maybe technical terms, just check that they are having an opportunity to say those words. So really that's your sort of formative assessment really, if they can say the words accurately and do they actually recognize what those key terms are. Another thing uh, which is a bit tricky in English is about inference. So uh, I've got a, a very simple instruction here from a shampoo bottle. Uh, wet hair, lather, rinse and repeat. Now there's, there is a certain amount of inferred meaning uh, in this very simple instruction. 
So as we read that, as a, definitely as a first language reader, uh, we would understand that we don't have to wet our hair for a second time and we don't need to repeat infinitely, maybe just once or twice. So it's really checking with definitely in the language of instructions, do they really understand, especially the inferred meanings sometimes that, that they are exposed to? Um, and also, th this really is something that I've mentioned before, but sometimes when learners read something, I know in my English as an additional language teaching, sometimes in an entire text, if a learner doesn't recognize just one word, they panic and they think, I don't understand the whole thing. So I think one thing uh, to really work with is it's okay to not know some words or some phrases, that's absolutely natural and to work on those, but don't let it be a barrier. Can they actually work out in the context of the sentence or the paragraph, what that word or phrase means? So the density of unfamiliar vocabulary can be quite daunting. So again, this goes back to my creating a safe learning environment. How can we put our learners at ease? How can we get them to think, okay, we don't know this word or this phrase, but let's work through this together. Um, and again, word order, sentence structure and syntax are all of the structures of the language as well. We just need to keep checking that uh, our learners are with us and they understand the language behind what they're reading. Okay, so I really posed lots of challenges to you, but I want to obviously help you with some solutions as well. So for me, this is really when you're thinking about your planning stage, for me, this is so important. Um, education is full of acronyms. So here I go with some acronyms here. So BICS uh, is Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills. So what this means is your learner's everyday speaking skills with English. So when you hear them speak, they might be they might sound really competent so when you're having general conversations you know that they're, they're really good with their use of english but i would say maybe don't be overconfident with that because it might not reflect their language skills in the academic um, sort of forum if you like so that moves me on to calp which is cognitive academic language proficiency so they may be able to converse really confidently with general things in english but actually, do they have the technical vocabulary and the academic uh, structures and vocabulary to talk about and process science? And then finally, your role as a teacher, I would really urge you to think about this if you don't do this already. And this is CLIL. So content and language integrated learning. So of course, one thing you will be absolutely doing is when you're planning and writing your lesson plans, you'll be thinking about the content of the science and what you want to achieve that lesson. But I would also encourage you to think about, okay, so this is this, I know this is the science content that I'm addressing today, but are there any particular technical vocabulary, academic vocabulary, or even structures that learners would benefit from knowing about as part of the lesson as well. So this is for me the key strategy if you don't do this already to really consider and if this is something new maybe start with the vocabulary but then you know think about structures so if you're going to be asking your learners to predict for example do they have the structures so you might give them some uh, sentence structures or some examples which they can then use again this is going to help to reduce the anxiety of looking at the subject within a language which is not their first language. Okay, um, so really just to, as a teacher, just think about these following areas. So what advanced preparation is necessary? So this might involve CLIL, for example. So what English uh, requirements uh, would help my learners as well as the science content? What teaching techniques best serve additional language learners? So actually, again, this echoes what Mark has mentioned earlier. And for me, um, I would say definitely have all four skills in every lesson. And what I mean by that is have opportunities where learners can write the language, read the language, say the language and hear 
the language. And all of these four skills together really reinforce both the science and also the English language as well. So when I've worked with teachers, very often it's the, the speaking bit, the conversation, the discussions, which is missing. So I'm really pleased Mark has really emphasized this earlier. So I, I would just sort of pin you back to that and just, just to analyze, you know, in your lessons, is there a particular skill that maybe you don't do as much as others and try and build that into your lessons? Now, of course, every single lesson, you're monitoring the progress of your science, the science of your learners uh, and the progress they're making with that. But I would also encourage you just to think about actually how are they making progress with their English as well as the science uh, progression. Um, how can your classroom be more effectively organized for content instruction? So maybe, I know this sounds really obvious, but just think about what is in your classroom. Is there an opportunity for uh, showing videos? Uh, are there posters that will support? Can you put a working wall up there where your learners write up some new words or words that they've not come across before uh, and then keep them up for, for the duration of that topic so that they've, they've got something to refer to? Uh, maybe encourage them to, to keep personal dictionaries as well where they're recording uh, some of the new vocabulary, maybe structures as well. Uh, they can use their first language as explanations and then get them to use that vocabulary in sentences of of their own and then you can read them and that's actually a bit of formative assessment to check if they're using the words correctly in their sentences. Uh, and finally, how can teachers design assessment for ESL learners? So really that goes back uh, to two points previous. So think about not only assessing the science progression but also the English and as, is there an opportunity even if it's just questioning, maybe some questions an answer uh, in your lesson which is checking the English as well. Um, finally, um, think about uh, directly teaching learning strategies. So again that comes back to my vocabulary and structures ideas. Demonstrate how to select the main idea and supporting details and how to sequence and summarize and any other structures that you think they might need actually teach them and demonstrate how they can do that. Encourage techniques such as marking essential concepts and vocabulary with a highlighter. Mark mentioned before about labeling diagrams, uh, creating word banks, organizing information on various types of graphic organizers. Graphic organizers are really useful. So don't forget all of these things. All of these things actually the learners can take responsibility for but as teachers, if you can just remind them of these strategies and encourage them to use them, then they're going to be in a much stronger position. And finally, of course, we want active learning throughout. If they are actively uh, responsible for their learning and they are uh, going through challenges, rather than us giving them the information, they're going to actually retain and use that information uh, much better, other than them being a, a passive uh, recipient. Um, so yeah, to try and avoid memorizing lists of these technical vocabulary but actually to use them in content or in context it is much much more valuable and that's me thank you very much wow that was brilliant the um i think i'm going to take or try to steal some of that from my own trainee teachers so I've been asked to talk about A-level um, and I'm going to start with what's the same because a lot is. Everything we said earlier about teaching and learning, both me and Sally, still applies. Teaching A-level is not just about explaining stuff brilliantly, although that is important, it's also about adhering to all of those principles that we had before. So students still need to think. They need to think up or think through ideas. Now, I used to think it was just me who thought about these things in this way. But the winner of the Biology Teacher of the Year competition um, a few years ago articulated this in exactly the same way. He even, those of you who are biologists, tried to get his students to think up the Krebs cycle. Can you imagine that? He didn't succeed on that one, but he did get them to think through it. So think up or think through ideas. Language is still important. Talking, reading, writing, still focus. Assessment for learning is still important. Practical work is still important. Inquiry is still important. 
all of this, these things which you're becoming so skilled at, at teaching IGCSE, now is your chance to really push that into A-level. A-level is not about explaining, A-level is about students learning. So what's different? Well, let's go to the syllabus and have a look. Now, I've taken the biology one because it includes most of the ideas that the physics and chemistry ones had. So the syllabus includes the main theoretical concepts which are fundamentals of the subject. Good, we knew that. But advanced practical skills are there and practical skills are now assessed. Okay, so those are two things that are important. We've got the application of ideas in novel contexts and we've got the course encouraging creative thinking and problem solving skills. So let's see what we can do with those ideas um, in terms of building on what we've already got for ALO. So handling, applying and evaluating, um, have a little scan down to the emboldened bits because really they are the different bits for A-level. So it's making predictions and constructing arguments, applying knowledge to new situations, evaluating information and hypotheses, and demonstrating an awareness of the limitations of biological or physics theories and models, or chemistry, and then experimental skills investigations, it's the same, pretty much. There's a little bit more emphasis on the evaluate, but if you look at those um, syllabus documents, they're pretty much matched. Whoa, now what does this slide show? This takes you all the mathematical skills from biology, chemistry and physics. And if you remember back in the GCSE bit earlier, this is a big expansion. It's a particularly big expansion for physics. It's quite a big expansion for biology, to be honest. And you'll notice the level of complexity and the depth of the mathematics differs between the subjects as well. That means this needs focus, okay. Um, and so think about the challenges we had before about maths think about the ways in which to overcome them. The bottom line is you've got to teach maths, okay? You've got to help them to get engaged in the maths and to use the maths. Do not expect them to come pre-organized with skills because they may not be able to apply. So where do we increase emphasis otherwise? Well, I think we increase the emphasis on practical work for obvious reasons. And if you look at the um, diagram on the screen, We've got the opportunity for practical work to build those practical skills, to build knowledge and understanding, and to build or enable them to access scientific inquiry. So really we've got those three things that we really highlighted earlier. Don't forget that evaluation. Make sure that when you're doing it, you know what you want your students to learn. It may well be process skills, but if that's what it is, make sure that you provide the right questions, the right scaffold, the right opportunities for them to realize what they're learning. It's so easy to think you just give a student a practical with a particular skill involved and they will learn that skill. Maybe not. Maybe you need to get them to reflect back on what they've done. Likewise, if the practical is designed to teach from something conceptual, then really focus in on that as well. The questions you ask or the worksheet you give them going alongside that practical is really the fundamental thing. And the discussion they have in pairs or groups about the practical is probably the most valuable tool you have to them learning. This maps it out a little bit more and I might let you read that on your own, but in terms of outcome, we've got, or in terms of structure, sorry, of this table, we've got domain of things you can handle and see on the left. We've got domain of ideas on the right and effective one is about will they do and see and effective two is about will they learn. Effective two bottom left quadrant or quadrant students can later recall and describe what they did in the activity and what they observed. Now that what they did is their process skills. Students can later discuss the activity using the ideas it was aiming to develop. There's your conceptual. And then at the top students do what was intended and see what they're meant to see. And during the activity, students think about what they're doing. It's a really helpful framework um, in, in order for you to make sure your practical work is valuable. In the inquiry, we looked at this table earlier, really at A level, you should be moving inquiries certainly to the middle column, not fully structured, but, but guided, or to the open column on the left, where students are building much of this independently in themselves. Can't do that straight away. Perhaps in the middle column is the right target um, in the first year available, and then in the second year available, try to shift a little bit more to the left. And likewise, the, the demand, which is inherent in each of these rows as well, differs too. But this table should help you to think those through. The other thing that we don't talk about much in science is about building argument. 
And the example given here is really designed to help you to focus in on the pieces of argument building so that when students are required to build argument, they know the kinds of things they need to write and they need to think about. So there might be a claim, blonde people are taller, there might be some evidence, the mean height of blonde haired and non-blonde haired people, there might be the woman which links the data to the claim. Because the mean height of blonde haired people is higher, blonde haired people are taller. Then there's the backing, the qualifiers and reservations, and the rebuttal of any counterclaim. Now, the last three rows are the things that are often forgotten by students. And this links into our causation and correlation argument in science, where just because something seems to have a relationship, it doesn't mean that one thing causes the other. So really have a look at this, think it through, and think how will you build this structure, perhaps even in a writing frame, into your students' write-ups or into your students' analyses of external data. Then the critiquing can build on that frame because if somebody has tried to develop an argument that hasn't dealt with each phase, they're easily critiquable. And remember, back in the skills required, they must be able to build and critique arguments. Debating approaches can help, and I've given you some ideas there, but really get them to think, what are the arguments that are being made? What are the assumptions behind the arguments? And how have the arguments been manipulated? A lot of this is topical. And remember the thing about novel contexts earlier in terms of analyzing things like global warming, arguments, etc. It's really important to get them these skills to be able to engage in that kind of debate. The other way you can encourage that creative thinking and problem solving is a way in which you facilitate learning. And you can't do that if you're just teaching or talking through the ideas. So try to, like Sally said, try to help them to realize they can make mistakes and it's okay to find things difficult. Value those mistakes, encourage risk taking, get them to explore a line of thought, even if it ends up down a blind alley. Getting stuck and unstuck is important. Listen to them, be encouraging, be interested in what they're doing and ask some questions. Get them thinking, create that kind of inspiring environment. Give value to work, either by praising it explicitly, displaying it, photographing it, mentioning it, putting it in a newsletter, whatever. Just use such praise to encourage their confidence so then they'll be more, interested, more likely to become creative. And circulate around your classroom, look at what they're doing, listen to their conversations, get a picture of how everyone's doing and what common problems they're having. And deal with those problems together and help them to stick at it. You can give a few hints, you can ask questions to make them think in a different way or encourage them to think of a different solution. You should try to offer just enough to help them to overcome their obstacles. And encourage collaboration with peers, arrange your lab to maximise interaction, give them chances to see, seek support from each other. And finally, encourage, I think finally, encourage reflective conversations that help them to clarify what they're trying to do and to help them to see why they may be finding something hard. Now, I'm going to say one thing before we do the last slide. These things should be in every lesson. They should be not just for A-level, but the model that for A-level teaching that I see a lot is a teacher standing at the front, maybe a little bit of discussion happening, but primarily it's teacher to student. What we've got to try to build is all of the things we've talked about in our A-level classes. Ownership of learning, peer collaboration, building learning, thinking things through. So, the principle behind everything is that students need to think, they need to think through ideas, they need to think up ideas, they do all of this best if they think together with others. And I think that's me done. So I, I'm not sure if Tamsin's coming back, um, but I'll, I'll vacate the chair and hopefully she will. And then I think we're going to do some questions in a moment. Right, thank you so much everyone who's joined us today. And thank you so much to Mark and Sally. Now, if you can hold with me for a second, we're going to do a QA and a if you've got time. But if you'd like to find out more about our resources, and we've also got sort of blog posts and videos with more advice and inspiration for teaching science, you can visit cambridge.org forward slash education forward slash science. And there's also the option there, if you haven't already, on the website to sign up to our e-newsletter list, which means you'd receive emails with information when you blog post, some written by Mark, some written by Sally, and videos of them coming through. <laughs> I just wanted to introduce you to uh, 
International AS and A-Level Science series that Mark has worked on as a pedagogy expert. So we've got we've worked very hard and done a lot of research to make sure our resources meet the specific needs of the science classroom. Some of the things we've been discussing today. So all of the components are meant to work together. We've got the course book, we've got the teacher's resource, they, they're the perfect pairing together. And then we've got additional support from the workbook and the practical workbook. And just showing you a quick overview here with the course book, the teacher's resource, and please note in the teacher's resource, you've got the practical teacher's guide that's included in that. So that will give you lots of guidance and help and include sample data, because we appreciate that sometimes it's not always possible to do a practical, but there's the sample data to work with anyway and work on those essential science skills. And on the next page there, I'll let you read this later because I will be sharing the slides and the video with you. Here's the practical workbook, and the workbook. So there's some additional support and you'll see in the workbook we've got over a hundred extra activities which gives you practice for your students for all those essential skills. And so it just leaves me to say thank you and goodbye. But thank you very much everyone, it was lovely to see you all, all around the world and good luck with your science teaching. <laughs>